My hero. Am I a hero? We're here to challenge your definition of a hero. Hello, everyone. Welcome to 10,000 Heroes Podcast. My name is Nathan Ramos. With me is Encore Shah Delight. And today we have a real treat for you because if you've been sitting there on your couch looking at the internet, wondering, should I buy some Bitcoin? <laughs> we have the answer for you on this episode. <laughs> on, on this episode, we're going to jump into it and find out why you missed the boat on cryptocurrency. Isn't that yeah, right? we, we actually have, we're interviewing Bitcoin today. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> today on the show is very, very exciting. Very exciting to have uh, Bitcoin on the show and uh, letting you know why it's important to buy some. Is that what this podcast is about? I yeah, know. I mean, no, not not at all. But oh. <laughs> but, it, but we touch on that. We touch okay. On that. Well, yeah. maybe maybe you could frame it a little bit different because actually, uh, all joking aside, I I found this this interview incredibly informative, and whatever I thought I knew about blockchain or its the the potential there, um, it really corrected a lot of misconceptions I had and really stoked my interest as well like what's possible here and got my got my wheels turning so um thank you for this and any anything else you want to say to kind of set it up yeah yeah as as we talk i talked with lucas lucas is our guest lucas geiger in the interview there's there's a whole lot of perspectives on what blockchain is how it's relevant what its potential is how it could or could not transform our society what we're getting here is just one perspective, right? We're getting Lucas's perspective. Sure. But I really like it because it's different than a couple of the dominant paradigms, you know, and it's, it's really, I'm going to tell a little story here. I went to the post office a couple of days ago after doing this episode or this interview, and I was sitting there in line in the post office with a bunch of masked people of different ages and genders. And the guy two steps in line in front of me, he was a middle-aged dude with a kid. He picks up his phone and shows it to the elderly lady between him and me and be like, oh, I bought this Shiba coin today at 13 and now it's at 29. I just, I'm just making money standing here in line. And the woman's like, oh, you know, I think my son does some of that in crypto. And then this guy two steps in line behind me, another old lady between me and this guy, because I live in this retirement community, is like, oh man, I put, I put $5 into Dogecoin you know, five years ago, and now it's 6,000. Um, so he's like, how do, you, how do you like that? And and these people, he's like, now I don't even use, this is, the, this is the line that really got me. I don't even use a savings account anymore. I just take money from my paycheck every month and put it right into Coinbase and buy random crypto. <laughs> so, <I> mean, <laughs> <laughs> well, do you have a point of view about that? Uh, yeah, I have many points of view. I work so I worked in blockchain for years. Right. I worked with I worked with this guest with Lucas. Um, Full transparency. Yeah, I'm educated about. You know, I'm a computer scientist and mathematician. I know about blockchain. I understand some of how it works. Uh, I'm horrified <laughs> from a from a risk analysis point of view. I'm horrified that this guy yeah. is putting all of his money into crypto that he knows nothing about. Which many of these coins in my in my opinion are kind of confidence games yeah. and somebody's going to be left holding the bag and i just hope it's not this guy you know and it's you know as we when i worked in blockchain there was a lot of thought about regulation and a lot of the people in blockchain are very critical of regulation the, the whole dream it's like this libertarian vision of like oh now we have financial instruments without regulation there's a whole other part of the blockchain community that really wants regulation sure. so it becomes more legitimized but this is the reason that they had financial regulation is because people are going around like selling weird pyramid schemes to people at county fairs 100 years ago, like this, you know, the financial version of the snake oil salesman. Yeah. And people get hurt. Yeah. You know, I had a friend that called me up last February or something, whenever the, the dip was the quote unquote dip, uh, Bitcoin. For, for Bitcoin, yeah. In Ethereum, I think. And he called me and he was just so adamant. He was like, we need a drain. You need to, whatever money you have saved. And whatever money you can borrow, you need to buy crypto right now. Like right now, that's what I'm doing. Like that, his project that day was to just empty all savings accounts and get whatever leverage he could 
borrow against whatever he had to buy more cryptocurrency. I don't have any uh, background like you, but something innately in me was like, this sounds like a bad idea. <laughs> well, actually, it was a, it was a good idea at that, at that moment. Yeah, if you, if you if you just really fully embrace hindsight bias, um, which is something we could have another podcast on is yeah. is how we're so susceptible to hindsight bias. But well, um, there's a lot of that. I mean, he, he did well at that at that day. I'm sure you know <laughs> if he yeah, did that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it's, it's crazy, man. It's totally crazy. But just the wow. fact that, the fact that like I was working in this area that was totally fringe four years ago and now the four people in line next to me at the post office two of them are over 70. oh yeah because the other lady's like oh yeah my son trades crypto too you know like all four of these people knew about it that was the other part that was like whoa this is i mean we're in the other world we're in that i didn't think we would ever be in this world where everybody it's not even about ethereum they're they know about coins i don't know about shiba coin you're like i don't know what the hell's going on with shiba coin you know it's like okay this is fully mainstream the post crazy office. You know, when you were working um, in that project, well, that was like five years ago or something like that. It wasn't that long ago. Yeah, four, three, four years ago. And it was an entirely different terrain at that moment. Oh, yeah. All right. Well, I'm, I'm excited. I think people will get a lot out of this episode. Yeah. I mean, what I love most about what Lucas is saying is he, he really sees and, you know, leave it up to the listeners to whether they think he's accurate or not, but he really sees the potential to serve society and to fill in gaps that are currently not being served in society mm -hmm. through this technology. So to me, that's a message. I love hope. It's a message of hope. Mm -hmm. Cool. Let's jump in. Lucas. Encore. We're here to talk about blockchain today. So I just have to ask you, you know, I just have to get this out of the way. Should I buy Bitcoin? Or Ethereum. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're, you're really throwing me into the deep end of this. This is certainly not anything I want to be on record saying <laughs> to the hordes of crypto mass masses on Twitter. But that's that's exactly why, you know, I, yeah. I feel like every conversation about blockchain is about money. Yeah. It's about how can I make money now yeah. or yesterday mm -hmm. or the opportunities I missed because I should have bought Bitcoin when it was at 5K or 1K or 300. And my sense is that you want to take this conversation in a different direction, or I hope you do. I hope we're not going to just talk about dollar bills and holding and Bitcoin and yeah. Ethereum. So I want to give you a chance to make that point right away. Yeah, that's right. It's a good question to ask. And I think it's, I think the audience that I would want to speak to now would ask that question. So I think there are a lot of folks out there that Obviously, you've heard of Bitcoin. Obviously, you've heard of cryptocurrency. Uh, you probably only know the word Bitcoin out there. Maybe you know that you're, you've missed something mm -hmm. and that there's something else happening that people are excited about, but it's sort of hard to piece it together. So I, I generally find myself speaking to that audience, being a bit of a translator of what I see, which is exciting me from the... Let's call them cypherpunk community. Um, you know, real, you know, dyed in the wool cryptographers and systems engineers. And what does this actually could possibly mean for for society? Um, and you know, disclosure, like I am an engineer now. I mean, I've been coding on on blockchains platforms for some time, um, but I actually have a psychology degree originally, and that's kind of where my original interests are. So I think with that out of the way, I, I think blockchain, and I think we'll have a better word for it in 10 years. So, but for now, we call this entire space blockchain. Um, the exciting thing about it is that it's this intersection of the hardest things to do in an open environment. So without any controls of government or companies. So it's the hardest things about coordinating people, um, coupled with the hardest things in certain kind of technology and distributed systems. And then a lot of the hardest things about money you know, and, about, and about economics and, and value. So, uh, and I think that's sort of the, what I think will appeal to people who are like engineers who know something about 
about blockchain, I've heard about blockchain, is that blockchain attracts some of the most spectacularly brilliant people you're going to meet. And so I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not so immodest that I'd count myself in that group, but that's my attraction to to being in this um, community. Those are just, the people you want to work with. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I've just met the most spectacularly brilliant people in my entire life um, in the you know, last five years I've been working in blockchain. Um, so I think that that is a sign that something's happening, and it's actually kind of deterministic, right? As soon as you put brilliant and delightful people that are motivated and incentivized to do something together, something's going to happen. So I think just, you know, maybe that might be the starting point for, for a lot of people. But then, like, what is the, what is the thing we're talking about? What, what is the thing? And I think there's a lot of noise and there's a lot of confusion. And I think that's actually normal for, you know, a, a technological paradigm shift, that there will be noise and there will be confusion. Um, so I think there are people out there that are very much in the Bitcoin camp, which is the revolution is about non-governmental money. Yeah. Blockchain is about money. That's the message you get from that. Yeah. Blockchain is a fantastic revolution that we've been able to make some discoveries in cryptography and distributed systems that will allow us to finally have money, which is unbiasable. So I think that's one story that's out there. And that's very much in the Bitcoin story. And I think that is a story. And I think it's an interesting story. Yeah. Um, and, and the response you get from that, because I've, I've talked to a lot of people about that. And I'm thinking of my friend Russ Mellon, who's mm -hmm. maybe in his late 60s. Mm. He worked uh, as an appraiser. He's like a totally practical guy, loves hunting, loves fishing. He's very intellectually aware. And every conversation we have about blockchain, he's like, but Ankh it's not backed by anybody. Mm -hmm. And that's the, that's kind of the crux of the whole Bitcoin blockchain is money approach. So you have, you have all these people being like, it's not backed by anybody. And all these other people being like, but it's not backed by anybody. Yeah. <laughs> there are people saying the same thing and some people are super excited about it. And some yeah. People and, that, and that's right. And that's interesting. And, yeah. and, you know, it's fascinating. And that's, you know, it, you know, it is still the, the biggest platform uh, out there, Bitcoin, and it's got the most adherence and it's got the most buy-in institutionally. And, you know, when you look at Bitcoin itself, technologically, it's spectacular. I mean, it's just this gem yeah. of a thing. You, you like beautiful. look at it from different angles and it's like, it's, it's not possible that this thing could work, right? Yeah. It's like completely surprising that, that, that it works. And it's just such a testament that so much is riding on it now. Like it's just mm. such a giant piggy bank that could be attacked and is, you know, people are attacking it and then it hasn't been broken yet. So right. kudos. That's, that's great. But that's yeah, not yeah. what you're interested in. It's not the end of the story of blockchains. Yeah. And, and I think that's the message to, to folks who are kind of on the fence of looking at, at, at blockchain and not really knowing how to, how to engage with it and, and why people are so excited about, uh, about it. So the non-governmental money is one story. Um, and I see it, and I think a lot of people in the industry will see it, it's an infrastructural component to what happens next. It's a building block. It's necessary, but not sufficient for something else that comes next. And so there, um, there, there are a few steps in what I see is gonna happen in, in our sort of general space. Um, but the thing that came after Bitcoin was Ethereum. And so specifically was that Ethereum made this, uh, this idea, this, this conceptual type of computer program, something called smart contract, um, made it practicable and made it um, a first class citizen on a blockchain platform that was based on off of Bitcoin. So, bit, so I mean, we don't need to get too much in the woods here, but Bitcoin isn't, hasn't been used for executing what are called smart contracts. And so the idea of smart contracts, I think, is the, first of all, that is the first revolution of blockchains. And that is the most important thing that's happening now in, in the technology space. And, you know, without trying to be hyperbolic about it, it's, it is a really important opportunity for society. It's the kind of thing that feels like it only comes around every hundred years or so. So I think that's something that's worth unpacking and, and it's worth it for, um, let's say, a little bit of crypto newbies to to 
uh, unpack. Yeah. So let's let's maybe I'll, I'll just take a stab at it, and you can yeah correct me. So my explanation of a smart contract is you and I make a deal now or make a bet now about something that's going to happen in the future. And it's based on an information source that we agree on now. Mm -hmm. And when it comes time, so maybe the bet is about the temperature in Denver two weeks from now. When it comes time two weeks from now, because we've stated the information source we're going to use, maybe it's weather underground or something like that, the bet can be paid out without any need for a few, for more consent on your part or my part. Correct. It can just happen automatically. Without enforcement, I think is, is the important. Okay. Sorry, without external enforcement. So it's the blockchain itself that is going to enforce this agreement. And that's quite powerful. So I think, I think we're going to have to, you know, explore this a, a little bit, but we can write any agreement we want on a smart contract. And then we're going to upload it to a blockchain. So Ethereum in, in, sort of in this example. And a blockchain is this neutral environment. You know, it's not owned by anybody. There isn't a CEO that can come and turn on or off the information that's on there or a smart contract that's on there. So it has this, what I, what I call this credible neutrality. And so you have this space that is credibly neutral and that will execute this piece of software that is encoding an agreement between people. Now, what's, I mean, this, this unfolds in sort of super interesting ways, which is like, you may not even have to know the parties in advance. You can just have a contract that says, you know, um, this is an insurance contract. And if you buy a, and, and this is something that somebody actually made on Ethereum, you, you can buy a flight cancellation insurance. So you say what flight you're on, you, you buy this cancellation insurance, and if the flight gets canceled, you get paid automatically uh, out of it. And what's sort of mind-bending about this, and it is mind-bending, is that there is no insurance company behind it. There's just a very simple piece of software, smart contract, on a platform that has no known parties on it and will provide you this service, which is a pretty sophisticated service. Um, insurance is a very sophisticated service. So that, that's how it unfolds, the, the power of smart contracts. Let me um, ask a couple questions about that example just to, to help yeah. capture this. So as someone who doesn't know much about it, let's say I, I hear that example and I think, well, how do I know I'm going to get paid? Mm -hmm. How do I know that there's money that will pay me like what if there's right a lot of yeah. people that bought insurance on the same flight the flight gets canceled yeah i still gonna get paid yeah all, all of those things apply um the insurance example isn't the best example because insurance is such a comp is such a complicated business um but yeah you would be able to inspect the block anybody can read into the blockchain all the information is public i think this is the, sort of the important model of, of bitcoin is that it's also a notary of information. And so, you know, in this flight contract insurance, the notary is the blockchain, the Ethereum smart uh, blockchain. And anybody could inspect if the pool of funds available for, for distribution is sufficient if you're buying a premium in advance. Okay, which is, so when which I is, wanna buy my flight insurance, I can look and hopefully someone's made a tool that makes this easier for me to see. I can look and see how funded the insurance pool is, how many contracts are currently out, whether it's all stacked on a certain flight that might imply there's some wrongdoing. It's all that's right. all available for me to see transparently before I right. choose to buy. Correct. Yeah, maybe we skip that part at the beginning. I mean, if you're if you're just approaching the blockchain now, and you know, and, and so Bitcoin is what you know. The the important thing about blockchains is that all the information. Is public it's a public ledger so for bitcoin it's a public ledger of a number in an account money it's credit in, in an account um but it's public and it's inspectable and anybody can see who has how much money it's pseudo anonymous like you don't actually have your name on there but you can if you know somebody's address you know how much money they have. and then so when you go into the smart contract world you can see what is the information in the smart contract in in so so does you know 
analogize to the database. So the, and you can analogize this also to the insurance company. You're able to look into the balance sheet of an insurance company at any given time. That seems very attractive. <laughs> it's, it's especially attractive for, for the financial world um, where we, there's just such a low, it's such a low trust environment. Yeah. That's the beginning of the story of smart contracts. And I think to really appreciate like where this can go, you need to see sort of some of the experiments people are doing or have been doing over the last you know, never, seven years now since Ethereum has been around. Um, I think the, the more interesting thing, and you know, of course there's, there's always regulatory questions that come into this. If you know, from, if you know anything about blockchain, you know that uh, the government tries to intervene in certain ways. And, um, but the one interesting thing that happened inevitably after sort of uh, a year into Ethereum was that people pulled together into something called the DAO, the Decentralized Autonomous Organization, which was basically a venture capital organization that had no known, um, let's say, principles, and you didn't know who the who the partners, limited partners, were in it, and it was just this organization that was going to invest in stuff. So, so a bunch of people use the start smart contract platform to pool their money, and then presumably have some kind of democratic process of deciding how they would right. fund projects. That's right. That's right. Okay. And um, of course, it, it took the American regulators some time, like years to actually catch up to this. But they eventually said, you know, okay, this is not, this is a problem. But you need to, so like, don't, don't let that cloud your sort of appreciation of this. The, the real interesting thing that happened was that there was no company there was no government involved. There were no necessarily principal instigators in this. It was just it was just somebody that said, this is something that should happen. And it created a scaffold for people to show up and be incentivized to show up and all get into agreement about something that should be done without knowing each other previously, but without... Um, necessarily knowing what's going to happen next but it, it created what you know people in, in game theory and in blockchain will call a shelling point basically a meeting a meeting place and rules of engagement um and that's really really exciting and and so since the dao and so the dao that dao disbanded uh, but people use the, the term dao to refer to all sorts of online informal communities that come together but come to consensus come to an agreement about how they're going to in interact with each other um, now there's a lot still to be done there but that's the, the that, that's one of the things that unfolds with smart contracts for example and um, so when you ask me you know bitcoin or ethereum well you say you, you don't really see dao type things showing up on Bitcoin. And so you're, yeah. you're, seeing, you're seeing that kind of innovation happen on places where smart contracts are a first-class citizen. The DAO, in my mind, as someone who's not fo followed it super closely, but has followed enough, is really associated with a giant failure in either blockchain technology or society, which is, which is there was a giant hack mm -hmm. and all this money was drained from it. And then I think yep. Ethereum maybe had to fork or there was some sort of whole issue yeah, around it. Is, that's right. Is that part of the example that you want to? I think it's a good example. I think it's a good example. The, so I think a couple of things, it points to unsolved problems in, in blockchain space. It also points to the question of governance, which are important questions. They might get a little bit in the weeds for, for where we're at today or for, for this audience today, but, um, the thing about these smart contracts is that they are technological artifacts. They need to be coded up by computer programmers. And you get into this just weird, all a lot of weird problems of computer science when you start talking about how do you execute programs on anonymous machines by anonymous people. Okay, let me be really a little getting... more 
specific with the question because like you're right we don't want to get into the weeds yeah. but was the fact that people tried or successfully at a certain point stole millions of dollars from this contract or this organization was that a bug like a technical bug or was that a a, a gap in social understanding like in yeah, which so, way does blockchain need to grow to fix that right so the, the i'll tell you how i experienced the story there was a bug in the software there was this unintended bug in the, in the way the software was written and also in the limitations of the ethereum platform at the time and it got caught just way too late it didn't get caught at all until somebody was able to exploit the software because mm. this is an open system anybody can access and do stuff with it but it was able someone was able to drain the, the entire account and it was a very large part of the ethereum let's say total, total let's say equivalent of equity the, the you know, the coin supply on Ethereum that was in that uh, account, the DAO, I don't remember exact numbers, but it was very high. It wouldn't surprise me if it was like 15, 20% more. And then what that provoked was just a crisis on the, of the Ethereum chain, generally speaking. And so that sparked a governance debate on Ethereum, which is, well, does Ethereum, is, is, does Ethereum do anything about this? Do, do the, People who are running the, the software of Ethereum collectively come together, uh, achieve a different social consensus to fix the bug and change the account balances back to how they were. So that was a, and that, that was a big debate at the, at the time. Uh, it landed on, yes, Ethereum is going to what they call fork, but uh, start a new chain based on the same in information from before the, the DAO hack and put in a different smart contract into it. Um, a cor corrected, corrected software so that the bug wouldn't be so easily ex exploited. Um, so so how, and, how if, if part of the, the selling point of the blockchain world is that it's not controlled by government or it's not controlled by a company or it's not controlled by Jeff Bezos or whatever, this sounds like a bailout. Mm -hmm. So how is, how is it different? Like no, it's not, it's not different. It's, it's not at all different. Um, the, the thing to appreciate here, and, and, and I think this is like, I'm getting into like this fierce debate that exists around this, this topic and around Bitcoin, but I'm going to try and like, try to stay sort of like, you know, bird's eye view from this is that Blockchains are just a social consensus. It's a social consensus in running certain software. And this, and this, you know, who's who taught me this language and who's a big proponent of this is Zaki Manian, who is also my collaborator on OL. The only thing that exists is social consensus, you'll say. And so there's a social consensus around running software that keeps this ledger alive. And so Bitcoin, Bitcoiners hate hate this, but Bitcoin is a social consensus. Mm -hmm. It's a group of people that decide that they want to run this software with these incentives for running it and keeps this information. And so it, it attracts, let's say, a certain community of people that believe that and want to do that. That community has those certain rules of engagement. It's the same thing with Ethereum. Now, the, how do I put this? With Ethereum, your canvas is much bigger you have a, and you have and you have much more of a palette of colors to to work with and so more things can go wrong and more things get you need interpretation to go correct so if you if you're just doing a ledger and this is no demerit to bitcoin right but this is this is the constraints that basically bitcoin put around it so that it could enforce his social consensus in, on a very large scale is that it, it just does less, right? It just, it doesn't, it, it doesn't make any guarantees about smart contracts. Um, and the community has said that they just are not going to try to enforce what's correct. Ethereum has gone in that direction as well. And, you know, since the DAO hack, I mean, that was, uh, and, and the response was super controversial and, the community said that they don't want that to happen again. And there was a similar hack that exploit that happened sometime later. And this was the Polkadot um, ICO contract. And I got, you know, 
almost all of their funds frozen. It was like $200 million at the time or something like that. And Ethereum specifically did not fork it. But again, that was a social consensus. It was the community decided that, hey, that was super traumatic to go through that debate mm. about the DAO thing. Like, we shouldn't have to be going through those kinds of debates again. We're just going to put our foot down and say, okay, no, we need to like really um, be more credibly neutral. This is my sorry, my interpretation of it. And so it's very much an environment where, yes, it is still social consensus. People can change the Ethereum to that, you know, a sufficiently large group of people can change the information on the Ethereum blockchain. Same thing for Bitcoin. Um, but there's a social consensus that you don't do that. And so you have this, I'm not going to say a fiction, but you have this belief in immutability that needs to be preserved to, for, for all this stuff to work. I use a different term. I, I, I generally say that these blockchains need credible neutrality. And part of credible neutrality is you say, well, we just don't, we just can't intervene if something went wrong because somebody program something incorrectly like the they can but they just decided not to yeah culturally and and culturally that's right and so it's about creating the culture of saying like if this this vision of the future that is going to unfold because of smart contracts is going to happen it, we need to double down on it being a incredibly neutral environment yeah. and the, the analog and this is my last intervention because I want to I want to get to something more interesting than money. That's like the whole point here. Right. But but I think it's it's good to start with it. The analog in our world is that if I break into your house and steal five hundred bucks from you, you can't go to the government and ask to get that back. Like in our world, you can. Right. right. You can be like, hey, get get that guy, <laughs> get me my money back. Right. May 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 not work, but in the Ethereum world, they're just or the Bitcoin world, they're just like, hey, we just don't do that. Right. That's that that that's correct. Yeah. Okay. So let's let's go to some place where you have more interest and passion. Like what's the what's the possibility here? Layer, you know, the first level that we talked about is digital money. Everyone's excited yeah. about that. You know, it, it appeals to our like little greed and gambling instincts, captures right. the popular imagination. The second level is the smart contracts. You start seeing like you're able to build more financial infrastructure that's a little bit more nerdy but the people who are into that are like wow this could be the future of of law or future how we make deals yeah yeah it's it's a it's this infrastructural piece that's that's exciting for the people working in it it's probably going to be invisible to the general public yeah right? so yeah. and i guess the to end the story of let's say smart contracts or the history of smart contracts, you have many, many blockchains now, hundreds, um, that people call Ethereum killers. They're, they're, they're going after Ethereum's bread and butter, which is, which is smart contracts. So I don't, I don't see it as competitive. I think it's just it's part of the evolution of blockchains. A, a, block, a modern blockchain needs to have smart contract capabilities because it creates all these opportunities for people to invent new financial products, but also um, memberships and, and governance and all sorts of amazing things that are gonna happen. Um, but again, necessary, but not sufficient. You need to have smart contracts now to have a useful blockchain that's gonna enable different types of use cases than we've seen with software uh, in the past. Um, so I think that's where I, I think maybe the second half of this chat, we should take that. So I think this is a sort of the primer for, for folks who just maybe weren't up to speed on um, how smart contracts came to be. But I think we need to think about what is the thing that is happening here when, when we talk about the DAO and we talk about this insurance example is the thing that is happening is that you're getting these opt-in communities. So people that are opting into being a part of a community somehow. They are opting into an agreement of some kind, and it's without any external intervention from a company or a government to enforce it. And that's important because every time we have something that we want to get done in society, we create a company or a nonprofit, 
that has a statute, you know, it's, it's, it has some legal standing that the government can endorse or revoke. And it has obligations that the a justice system, which is backed by the government, is going to, is going to carry out basic statutes and, and agreements of, of companies. So you have this entire infrastructure that is behind getting something done in society that needs to be uh, created and respected. Yeah. And what is interesting about blockchain for many people is that, well, hang on, like if I can just get agreement between parties of people with this invisible software module, where do I need enforcement? Like if, if we just code this software in a way that doesn't, that doesn't leave much room for subjectivity, or at least it's a subjectivity that can be managed by the, the community itself. Like what, what do we need? What do we need the government to be involved in this for? What do we need the legal system to be involved in this? And, and, and so I'll stop here because this, this appeals to a certain sort of politics, which is very yeah. libertarian it's, it's, kind it's, of politics. It's like libertarian community building. Right. Just like, oh man, we want to have a party. The only way we're going to get all these people to show up to the party and hang out is is by appealing to their self interest. So we, right. we we carve out like the money layer, and then we can use that to have the parties we want to have. Right, right. And I think that that appeals to let's say liberal in the in the classical sense yeah. people that you know this is economic something economic liberalism. That, yeah, economic liberalism, and this this appeals to. A type of freedom that, that, that you can have. And I think people take it to all the way to the other, to the extreme of saying, well, and this is where the cypherpunk manifesto comes in, that you don't, you do not need governments after all, if you can, if you can achieve these things. So I think that's, that's, you know, that's one extreme. But then there's this other maybe cohort, which is, well, we don't necessarily need to use smart contracts and DAOs to replace things that are out there in the world. We might be able to use it to get things that we're not yet able to do. That's generally the space that I'm more interested in exploring, which is, you know, the, the, the analogy I think people would be most familiar with is, I mean, I might be dating myself, but I think there are people here that remember a time before smartphones and you know, there was a time when Apple released the iPhone where people were saying like, I mean, hang on, like, why do I actually want a phone coupled with my camera? And like, you know, Blackberry is fine for sending emails, but it's this idea that a new platform emerges in technology that enables new use cases that you couldn't imagine doing before. So like Uber, could Uber have happened just with a browser on, and, and a desk and a, you know, using your laptop? I mean, probably not. The fact that Uber emerges after this, this new technology paradigm exists, I mean, that's just keep that just that's what that's what always happens with technology and technology platforms. The expectation is that the same thing is going to happen with blockchain. Is that okay? Right now, we're trying to simulate and replicate companies and do governmental things like money and things like finance, you know, do, do different types of, of mortgages and lending on a blockchain. But then what's the, what's the, actually, what's the Uber of blockchain? And I, I, I'm not actually convinced we've seen it yet. So this is my perspective. I think we've seen a lot of foundational and infrastructural things and I think which are important. And I want to encourage people to keep building it. Like, you know, building the, the the consensus layers of blockchain. You know, that's that's important. The DeFi uh, primitives of finance super important. You got to do it, but it's not the goal. That's not the that's not the destination. Okay, let me let me recap that a little bit. I mean, there's there's a lot of interesting material in that libertarian community building vision. There's some quirks. There's some issues. I don't we don't have to get into that. But but I'll just just to, to hint at that. The reason that works, the reason these things are self-enforcing, they don't need external enforcement, they don't need the guys with the guns and whatnot, is because it's, it's pay to play and you lose your stake. Yeah, a lot, a lot of times that's the only way to make a game work is that, you, and, and, and that has this problem, and that has this problems if we're, if, if, if we're going to try to unfold those models for the rest of society, like, you know, 
not everybody can pay to play. So it's, yeah, exactly. In my language and my way of speaking about this, you know, I also have a role as a leader and I have influence in the OL uh, community. And um, the important thing for me is that OL, like any blockchain, is a neut- incredibly neutral environment. That's well, that's well said. So there's, there's two really common narratives in the blockchain world. One is it's all about like the money, which is not the narrative you're advocating. And the other one, which is also very common, is that it's about disruption. Mm-hmm. And so what I find a little more surprising is that's also not what, what you're advocating. I mean, that's, that's a part of it, but you're not, you're not focusing on, hey, let's get rid of the companies or let's get rid of the governments and replace them with blockchains. You're talking about what are the unmet needs our society has right now that are currently not filled by anybody. And that's where you want the blockchains to go. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, I think I know I do want my brand to be about disruption. I think things have to change. I think you just need to look around and, and see like, how do you feel about health, justice, journalism, in your country right now. I mean, it's probably, if it's, if it's the country I'm living in, it's something like a dumpster fire, all of those things. The story for me is that governments and companies can't solve all of the needs. And that's, you know, nonprofits emerge in that space. Right? I think it's just like, you know, you know it's, sort of, it's actually kind of surprising how many nonprofits exist in, in the world. They're just you know, trying to solve unmet needs that companies and governments aren't providing. And so what I'm proposing and what I want to create a meeting point for, a shelling point for people to join is, well, you know, couldn't blockchain occupy that space a little bit more? It doesn't mean dismantling governments. It doesn't mean replacing companies. Companies are good at what they do. You're not going to, governments raise, have armies, you know, you're not, I'm, I don't anticipate blockchains, you know, raising a standing army, but maybe that's just a failure of my imagination. (laughs) So, but you have this blue ocean of just stuff that needs to happen that people want done. Okay. So let's, let's, I want to help you make that, make that case. Cause when we talk about what governments, companies and nonprofits are doing, Mm -hmm. it's very clear. We all have very good intuitions around it. But when we talk about what blockchain what can blockchain do for me? Mm. It's not just about dollar bills. Yeah. Can you make that clear? Can can, can yeah. that be as, you know, inspiring and motivating? Yeah. As so, what the Bitcoin people have done. Yeah. So no, <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to be able to get it down to a crisp, uh, you know, story like non-governmental money. Uh, unfortunately, I just we're not there yet uh, with blockchain. We don't even have the language to talk about these things. I think yet. And so I, the, but I will issue some caveats in advance, which is like all this stuff we're talking about in blockchains is experimental and is speculative. Um, but there's a lot of good reason to believe that things can change because of blockchain. Um, so, I mean, we'll start with like, you know, we started with the insurance example, which I think is a pretty good, pretty good example for this. Um, insurance is something that, you know, there are a bunch of insurances that we might want in our life that isn't a good enough business model for a company and isn't um, something that the government is going to, you know, get coordinated to do. So, you know, flight insurance, you know, yeah, okay. That's an, that's, is an insurance that you can buy as part of a package with travel plan, whatever, but the atomic flight insurance thing isn't really, a product that's out there, you know? And so would a company, would we, and would we even trust a company to do, you know, these atomic little insurance contracts? Um, I, don't, I don't know that, I, I think we would trust it more now, but like long-term in 10 years, we might actually might get more comfortable with, you know, these micro, micro insurance things being run by all, all, of, all of the infrastructure that blockchain is provided and not just technical, but, the, the social layer of it uh, as well. So I think that is one one way you can start looking at it. Um, but I think we do, I'm, I'm gonna step back a little bit and I think this is, is gonna strike people as unrealistic, but I do think that right now blockchain needs the bigger bets, 
needs mu needs more moonshots really and much more speculative things like we do need to go into health we do need to go into justice we do need to go into journalism things that i've mentioned um we i think i think in we might not be ready for it yet in terms of infrastructurally um, and with the regulatory environment and all that, but we need people that are coming and thinking about these things. But I think it's it's a no, it's a good time to join in that. I think if you wanted to do, you know, health benefits interventions five years ago um, or seven years ago around the theme, just the infrastructure wasn't there. Um, there wasn't even the language to talk about it. I think now we're we're able to transition from this this phase in blockchain where we're talking where we're it's all about the only conversations that matter are about the infrastructure or about how fast your blockchain is, what you yeah. do to, okay, so now what are the use cases you're enabling, which is, which is I think the next thing. And then fundamentally, like what does, you know, later on is like, what does a membership in your blockchain actually buy you? You know, initially it's just like this equity and this money, money equity like thing. And it's just ben benefit is getting rich, but like 10 years from now, it's a, what, what is a membership in this? Yeah. What's the game mean? that you want to participate in? So I'm, I'm asking you for these three killer apps examples mm. that are really mm -hmm. going to make people come on fire. And you're, <laughs> and you're telling me like, this is the, this is the time in the, in the arc where we need, you know, of the 10,000 people listening to this, we need them to come up with the ideas for these killer yeah, apps. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like I can propose things and I'm working on things uh, myself. Um, I, I can rattle off a, a, a few of the things I'm working on. I mean, but I, I don't trust myself to actually pick the winner as much as I trust a telecom company in the 90s or an ISP provider in the 90s <laughs> to have picked Amazon, Google, um, Facebook as, as kind of winners of the the internet yeah you know so so like i don't I like i'm not so immodest that i would i would uh i would bet that but now is the time that you that people who think about these problems can join the blockchain i think maybe maybe that's the biggest invitation as we're closing sort of the, the conversation is uh there was a time in blockchain where you had to be a um systems level engineer or computer scientist dealing with um, consensus questions and networking questions. That time's almost all past. Everything's going to start resembling uh, one another. And so the next race is for the application layer. So like, what, what are these killer apps going to look like? And so the invitation is, well, now if you are a social scientist, if you're a psychologist, if you're if you're an MBA, um, there's actually a lot of fertile ground for you to come and design things on blockchain. And um, again, for OL, we're trying to make this a very neutral place and we want to be able to invite those people as well. Um, because I think it's gonna, it's gonna really require not just spectacular software developers to come on board with us, but you know, spectacular social scientists to design new games. So is there an invitation that's more, are you inviting people to work with you specifically? Do you have a call for proposals or some kind of grant system or, yeah, or is, is that just more general? The reason you might want to check out OL is that for me personally, I'm working with the most brilliant and delightful people that I've worked with in my entire professional career. Brilliant computer scientists, brilliant economists, brilliant social scientists. These are people that actually want to see something happen with blockchains and uh, are really in a good place to make something unique happen. So I encourage you to come check it out. If you go to our GitHub website, uh, github.com slash OLSF, um, you have a link there to our Discord server. Just come in, have a chat with us. Fantastic. Thank you, Lucas. Thank you, everybody, for listening. This has been another episode of 10,000 Heroes. Please check out the show notes at 10kh.show for more about Lucas and Open Libra. And hit us up on, on Twitter. We have a Twitter now, 10,000 Heroes Pod. 
Tell us what you think. I'm really curious to know what your, what your reactions are and how it's affected you. All right.